Good morning and welcome. This is such a beautiful day and we're looking for signs of spring under the snow and the Bergens are in green so that's a sign of spring, right? I'm Reverend Marty and we're going to start with a welcome song. Um, it's called Welcome Song and the words will be on the screen. If you want to look at the music, it's in the little green book that came with your bulletin number 3152. Feel free to stand if you are able. Officially, it's so nice to see you all here. In case you're not familiar with this congregation or church, I'd like to just fill you in on a couple of details. One, the bathrooms are right through this door on either side of the hallway. Um, after church, we have a social time, just a meet and greet um, with coffee and refreshments. And that's through this door and to the right, so follow the crowd. Um, this, uh, I just wanted to let you know that next Sunday we will be doing a special collection for our United Methodist Committee on Relief, lovingly known as UMCOR, um, because, you know, who wants to always say the other long thing? And I just thought for a moment I'd like to tell you something that I heard about UMCOR that really made my heart sing, and that was because I work for a foundation, when we had Lee and Irene um, wiping out um, major portions of the middle of our state, I got invited to a meeting of funders and service providers and emergency response people. So the, the guy who had been assigned to the whole situation as the head of operations by FEMA was at the table. And when we were going around, I mentioned not only that I worked for the foundation, but also at that time, I was president of the trustees for the conference. And I thought that might be important because we had some resources that we might make available. And that guy from FEMA stopped everything and he said, you're from the Methodists? They're the best. UMCOR is always first on the scene and they're so reliable and trustworthy and they know what they're doing. And so, next week, you'll have the opportunity to contribute to that. And everything that you contribute um, uh, helps with those emergency situations all around the world, not just locally, but all around the world. So. And they, unlike a lot of uh, other places where you could donate, almost all of the money goes really to the people who are the victims of, of disasters. So. Um, 
So I'm glad you're all here. I will uh, move on to worship. Just so that you know, this is part of a, um, the service today is part of a, a series about forgiveness. And um, it, it based on a book by Adam Hamilton, which we have available if you're interested in seeing more. So the next, uh, we're going to get ourselves set up for the theme with Where Charity and Love Prevail, um, which will be on the screens. Thanks. Scripture is from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 to 22. And this is reading from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every word might be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whenever you bind, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you ag agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Conflict is the gadfly of thought. It stirs us to observation and memory. It instigates us to invention. It shocks us out of sheep-like passivity and sets us noting and contriving. Conflict is a sine qua non of reflection and ingenuity. This quote from the educator and philosopher John Dewey, as well as some of the next paragraph, was included in an article by the Mennonite peace writer John Paul Lederach. He goes on, most conflict discussions start by talking about defining conflict and what is it. But how would we, how would be if we talked about what is conflict like? So find a margin of your bulletin. George has left us all kinds of white space here. 
And uh, I want you to complete the following sentences. This is for your eyes only. You will not be asked to share this with anyone. First one is, conflict is like, finish the sentence. Conflict is like, Got, a, got something to write with? There should be pencils in the pews. The second one is, my family does conflict like, my family does conflict like, And the third one is, I do conflict like, fill in the blank. I do conflict like. What metaphors or images that come to mind there might depend on the cultural context in which you grew up. For instance, speaking globally, there are broad differences between East and West. Our word conflict in the West comes from the Latin root confligere, which sounds like conflagration or striking. It means literally to strike together. So you get images of flint and rock, maybe uh, our ancestors darting that with the campfire. Or we talk about heat being one of the most common metaphors for conflict here in the West. We speak of a heated discussion. We describe someone as boiling mad. An issue is too hot to handle. Someone being a hothead. Problems simmering just under the surface. The Chinese, on the other hand, form the symbol in their pictograph language for conflict by combining two other symbols, danger, and opportunity. Your conflict is perceived not so much as in terms of collision or force or heat, but rather simply as a challenge. So here's our third week. We're beginning on our series on forgiveness. And in the first week, we looked at our relationship with God and how temptations to be less than our best self sometimes lead us to wander in the wilderness for a while, but don't panic, it's just a test. Then we looked at sin and forgiveness in the context of our intimate relationships and how we are sometimes called to advocate for those out of power. Today, the concentric circles of forgiveness leading from God out through our intimate partnerships and into the world bring us to the circle of the community of faith. So we go to Matthew's Gospel, which is the only Gospel that uses the word church. And here Jesus gives us pretty specific directions on how to cope with conflict in the life of faith in the community. It's such a precious gift. But wait, what? Conflict? In the church? More and more people in our day did not grow up in the context of any faith community. And these words might not sound like they could ever go together. Conflict in the church. Sometimes we idolize or idealize church as a place where the ordinary tensions, ego trips, gossip, jealousy, heartbreak of our everyday life in families or at work or at school just shouldn't happen. But read the Gospels. Read Paul's letters. The church is and has always been a human institution. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, called the members of his societies to go on to perfection. But we all know that we have a long, long, long way to go, don't we? Peter had a long way to go, didn't he? His question to Jesus toward the end of what Bob just read to us gave us our metaphor for today. Bob didn't read it in a whiny voice, but I think Peter is kind of whining here, don't you? Don't you think, how many times do I have to forgive my brother, Jesus? As many as seven times? Jesus' followers who heard Peter's whine would have known the boast of Lamech in Genesis 4 in the Hebrew Scriptures. Lamech, the son of Cain, 
who warned that he would avenge his enemies 77-fold. So what Jesus is saying to Peter and to all of us is that when we've made the choice to forgive another, we have decided not to seek revenge because love doesn't keep score, as the Apostle Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians 13. Love does not keep a tally of wrongs. We started our series by recognizing the reality of two things in life, sin and forgiveness. Sin is a real thing in life. Us progressives like to kind of downplay it sometimes, I think, but people really do hurt each other and sometimes on purpose, and we definitely could call that sin. And forgiveness is also a real thing in life, a real force in the universe that liberates and frees and releases us. When we choose, however, to keep score, to keep a record of wrongs, when we store up the hurts that we absorb from one another, that is not good for us. We're going to watch a little part of a video from this week's Adam Hamilton session. See what he has to say about that. I want to remind you of something that you know intuitively, but most recently there have been actual medical studies done that have indicated to us that, your, that our unwillingness to forgive, when we hold on to resentment and bitterness and hate and anger, it has a negative impact on our bodies. I mean, physiologically, it harms us. It, of course, harms us also when it comes to our spiritual lives and our emotional lives, our relationships. But, but physically, when we hold on to bitterness and hate and anger and, and resentment, we find stress is increased in our lives. The brain produces more of certain chemicals that it's not meant to produce on a regular basis or an ongoing basis. We find that has an impact on our cardiovascular systems. It affects our, our physiology, our, our, our uh, muscular system. There's a whole host of ways it gives us ulcers, it, a whole host of ways that physically we are harmed by this. Our lives are shortened by holding on to resentment and pain, bitterness and, and hate and heartbreak. Which is why I think James says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. That passage of scripture is found in the context of, of discussions James is having about physical healing in our bodies. And he's saying one way that you find healing physically is when you confess to somebody that you've wronged and you ask for forgiveness from them. Because when you're in the place where you're the one who's done the wrong, you also find this physiologically harms you. And and you bring healing to the person that you've harmed. So in every way, forgiveness is an essential part of health in our lives, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Now, during this series of sermons, we... All right, so those of you in the class, you'll get to hear the rest of that this week. So knowing all that, and that just makes sense, doesn't it? Why, why do we sometimes avoid conflict? Why do some of us store it up, keep it inside, fail to go to another when we've wronged them or whether when they've wronged us? Why do we do that? Any ideas on that? Why do we not always take care of it right when it's happened? Fear, certainly. Pride, yes. <laughs> Lots of reasons, aren't there? Yeah. When I was trained as a mediator, we were taught care fronting. That's just kind of a funny made up word about, that talks about confronting each other in not just a caring way, but out of caring because it's so much better to nip things in the bud, using our best listening skills not to shame the other or to add insult to injury, but to turn our critic into our teacher, keeping our curiosity intact. That keeps us up in the higher levels of the brain rather than down in this reptilian brain where we tend to retreat to when we're really coming out of fear or pride. You can't learn anything or make any progress in human relationship if your curiosity has evaporated in favor of anxiety or fear. So stay curious, my friends. Curious about yourself, about your own motives, about your habits, curious about the other and maybe what they heard you coming out of your mouth was what, not what you said because they brought to the situation their own filters and their own family background and 
whatever. Stay curious about all of that. So when we approach conflict as an opportunity for learning more about ourselves and about others and about the community of faith, we're less likely to resort to unfair tactics, less likely to make the situation worse. That's why back at the Alban Institute days, they used to say the pastor's job is to make sure there is the appropriate level of conflict going on at all times. That sounds like a strange thing to say, huh? Because what happens if there's no conflict going on in the faith community? Well, there's a couple explanations. One is that nobody's talking about it. Another is that there isn't anything going on. <laughs> or both, right? When I do premarital counseling, I always use a questionnaire. It's a true false, it's not a test, you can't flunk it, it's more or less a conversation starter. But one of the statements they're asked to mark true or false is, Conflict is not a good thing in a relationship. True or false? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by conflict, right? That person reading that statement is coming out of their own family background, how they grew up, and maybe they grew up in a yelling family, maybe they grew up in a hitting family, maybe they grew up in a silent treatment family, or maybe they grew up in a family I don't want to brag, but my family had family meetings. Starting when, you know, we were all little tiny people and we had minutes. I remember looking back at these minutes and my sister Sarah says, ba and ka. <laughs> she couldn't even really make words yet. We had family meetings, you know, where one of us was chairing the meeting and had an agenda and, you know, kids had grievances. The parents were going out to too many meetings. You know, my father's a pastor. But we had to talk these things out. Didn't always work, but I thought it was very good modeling. So when, you, when you're about to commit yourself to somebody for life, that's a good conversation to have. What is conflict? How, would you, how are you taught to deal with it? Because they say you learn most you know about marriage before the age of four. So you gotta talk about these things. Very important conversation. That's why Jesus gives us Matthew 18. Here are some simple, specific directions on how to handle conflict in the church. One, two, three. Simple, but far from easy. First, if there's a breach in relationship in church, he says, go to that person. Go to the person involved. Not in front of others. Have a private, honest, respectful confrontation. How much heartache we could spare ourselves and others if we would follow, if I would follow, if all, any of us would follow this simple directive. It's so much harder now, I think, more challenging with social media. Because it's so tempting when we feel wrong just to put it out there on Facebook or to send a text or a tweet to tell everybody else in the world except the one who we feel has wronged us. In the world of family systems work, that's called triangling. He says, well, what's wrong with triangles? Okay, let's say, pretend this is, a, this is your relationship with this person. You're over here, this person's over here, and now you have a break in the relationship. Wow, I couldn't do that again if I tried. A break in the relationship. So this person's out there, cut off. So instead of going to that person, you are talking to this person over here. And there's all this energy going back and forth over here but none to there, because that's a break. And then this person's, you know, giving you a lot of good feedback and support, and is that really helping you over here? No. And then the triangle is broken, isn't it? Because this person's relationship with that person is also a mess. So we can add that to our pile of six, which represent all the different ways in which we pile things on ourselves and fail to seek forgiveness. Sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never harm you. I remember hearing that when I was a kid. That is not true. <laughs> words can be very, very harmful. But this, what uh, Jesus gives us here is so helpful. It really is helpful. It's so commonsensical. Jesus says, do that hard work of care fronting. Don't keep score, don't triangle, go directly to the person involved 
and ask for some time. At least try. If you try, if it doesn't work, try again. Ask if you could bring a couple people to be faithful listeners. Don't bring people who already agree with you. Bring some who will keep that conversation godly. If that doesn't work, you can ask for the prayers and presence of the body. He says, if that doesn't work, then you treat the brother or sister who has wronged you as a Gentile or a tax collector. And how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He loved them and welcomed them and included them and accepted them and reminded them that they are infinitely valuable children of God. See how much persistence this process takes? It's tough. It's hard work. It's so easy to be tempted not to go there or to start and then give up whenever things get tough. But here's how important it is. This is one of the only places in this gospel where Jesus promises to show up. When Jesus' birth is prophesied in the Gospel of Matthew, his earthly father, Joseph, in a dream, hears the angel say, his name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And at the very end of the Gospel, after Jesus has risen from the dead, just before he ascends into God's presence, he promises I will be with you till the end of time. So this gospel begins and ends with Jesus' promise to be with us, God with us. And here smack in the middle of this gospel comes the promise again, specifically when we do the hard work of human relationships, of dealing honestly and directly and respectfully with the conflict that will inevitably come up in our community of faith because we are human when we do the hard work of conflict transformation. Not keeping score, not triangling, forgiving for the umpteenth time without either playing the victim or the doormat. That's precisely when the risen Christ shows up. For wherever two or three are gathered in my name, they're doing the hard and necessary work of healing from those inevitable breaches of relationship. There I am. In the midst of you, he says. That's his promise. Amen? Hallelujah. Someone has, says, has said, community is conflict done well. Let us take Jesus at his word. May we be known as a community that does conflict well. This uh, next song we're going to do is a band song, but feel free to join in. It's not confession, it says in Bulletin's confession. We did that one last week. We might do it again. That was a great song. We're going to do a song that I hope will become our anthem. It's called Hold Us Together. several weeks. I want to make sure you all know who we are. On the drums, we have Mark and Anthony. On the guitars, we have Kian and Chris. On the cello and the piano, sometimes, is our director, Maura. So let's give a hand to the band. Woohoo! All right, sing along whenever you feel, feel comfortable. If you feel like you stay seated for this one. It don't have a job Don't pay your bills Won't buy you a home in Beverly Hills Won't fix your life In five even steps
reconciliation. You may stay right in your seat if you would like. And other people like to walk all around the room and greet every single person in the room. So the peace of Christ be with all.
Good morning. I'm Christine McDonald. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Social Action Missions team here at Christ Church. And I'm here this morning with installment three of March Mission Madness 2017. Nothing to do with the big basketball tournaments that are going on right now. Uh, but March Mission Madness is when we concentrate on raising funds and awareness of four of the helping agencies here in Troy. Past two weeks we have talked about uh, Joseph's House and TAUM, and today we are going to be talking about Unity House, um, located here in Troy. Um, Unity House is a big organization, and they're basically here to serve and empower people in need. One of the ways they do it is through um, community resources, and community resources really encompass a lot. Um, they provide emergency assistance to somebody who's um, facing eviction or they're going to lose, say, um, power and need some assistance to get their rent paid or their utilities turned back on. They work with people on employment and training, especially people who normally have limited opportunities, um, skills, or work experience. They have a family and neighborhood resource center, um, which helps um, community groups secure resources, um, help them work together and improve um, financial literacy too. They have a food pantry that's open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30, um, and Thursdays until 7, which is nice to have those evening hours. That's something they started last year. They also have a meal program where they serve lunch seven days a week and people who attend the meal also have access to laundry and shower facilities. They run the Restyle Thrift Store, which is open Monday through Friday, including Thursday evenings. You donate items to them, they sell them back to people um, at affordable prices. And finally, under Community Resources, Basics for Babies, which is uh, for parents in need, providing three-day supplies of food, diapers, formula, baby food, things like that. They also um, offer housing and support services, uh, working with people with mental illness, people with HIV AIDS, um, people who um, are, are drug users, victims of domestic violence, people who are homeless. So really uh, incorporates um, a lot of the community and they provide um, assistance to secure housing but also case management and support services to um, help maintain that housing. They also are a big provider of domestic violence programs from a 24-hour hotline to help with legal services to providing um, emergency shelter and free cell phones and uh, education and outreach to the community, including, including to teenagers um, in terms of educating about um, violence uh, during dating. Um, also, Unity House runs the Unity Sunshine Program. Uh, that provides early intervention services and preschool services, uh, including uh, therapies and uh, site consultations and general skill training for um, those with developmental delays. And a traveling summer camp, which is a free camp for kids ages 5 to 12. Um, they've helped about 100 children so far um, in this summer camp, which is all funded through people's donations. And finally, PROS, which is, uh, stands for Personal Recovery Oriented Services. So basically, they're working with someone who has mental illness to help them with rehabilitation, rehabilitation treatment, support services to get them um, functioning in the community and possibly back to work um, the best way possible. So, like I said, this week we are focusing on Unity House. If you are able to make a financial donation to them, uh, you can do that by check um, made out to Christ Church and indicating that it's for March Mission Madness and Unity House. Or, and please include them in your prayers. And um, all the programs we talk about are welcome volunteers, so consider offering some service there too. Another way you can support Unity House and the other three organizations is through our spaghetti dinner, which is coming up on um, March 31st. You may have seen the flyers in the back or uh, up front here as you came in. 
Um, this is a big undertaking for the church. We're hoping that uh, if you're not able to attend, you might be able to provide some help ahead of time. We have all kinds of things for all kinds of different uh, people to do. Um, there's shopping to do, there's advertising to do, there's setup to do, there's um, pre-food uh, preparation for, of food a couple days ahead of time if you can't be there that night to cook or serve or attend the meal. Remember the profits from all of the tickets sold um, get donated to the four helping agencies and you get to vote if there's one in particular or two in particular that you really love and want your uh, ticket proceeds to go to, you have a chance to do that. Um, remember, you can buy tickets on our website. There's also an opportunity there on the website if you'd like to donate a ticket to someone else to be able to attend or support the cost of the meal to maximize the proceeds that are going to the helping um, agencies. You can do that. If you saw, there's a small flyer up front and in the back. Um, you can contact me by phone or by email if you'd like to help. Talk to me today. There's sign-up sheets on the church office window if you go out here and to your left before or after you go to the right and get your uh, treats and coffee after the service. Some other ways that you can uh, serve coming up here in the uh, next few days, we are looking for some help in the nursery. There's a nursery assistant sign-up in the back of the sanctuary on the Welcome Center. Um, you do have to um, be background checked for that. If you have already been through that background check, um, please consider signing up to help um, in March and April. And if you're um, interested in doing that but haven't been background checked, certainly talk to um, Pastor Marty. Another way to serve is through the Crop Walk, which is coming up on May 7th. And Nancy Bergen in the green back there um, can give you more information about Crop Walk. She has uh, the Walker's Packets if you'd like to walk to raise money uh, for food pantries locally and internationally, or if you'd like to sponsor someone, see Nancy. We're accepting donations for laundry detergent to go to the Work Center Food Pantry in the uh, Rubbermaid bin there in the back. And Joseph's House is still looking for donations of sweatpants, medium to extra largely extra extra large excuse me medium to xxl you can put those in that bin or uh, in the church office and we'll get them uh, get them over to joseph's house uh, let's see in terms of uh, questioning and growing tomorrow night's book study on forgiveness had to be moved this week until tonight at seven o'clock so if you were planning on attending tomorrow night come tonight at seven o'clock instead same location Leadership team, which you know is uh, new to um, church, our 18-member uh, um, group that deals with the business of the church is meeting on Wednesday at 7. Uh, if you're on the team, I hope to see you there as the uh, chair of that team. Um, but remember that all are welcome. Those are open meetings unless we're dealing with a private uh, personnel issue. And finally, I think my last announcement is that this is the last Sunday to order Memorial Easter flowers. So you, if you are interested in that, you'll see information in the bulletin. You can see Marilyn Blom, who is up here in the blue blazer, or you can use the envelopes um, that are in your pew. Thank you. Let us uh, recenter ourselves in prayer. O oh, Holy One, who so often greeted our sisters and brothers of faith in times of great change, times of loss, of depression, times of despair and emptiness, who also in what seemed like just ordinary, ordinary times greeted our forebears in faith saying, fear not, peace be with you. We remember these words spoken to the betrothed Mary and Joseph, to Mary Magdalene in the garden, 
to Abram and Sarai and Sarai's barrenness, to Elizabeth and Zechariah in their old age, to the disciples gathered behind closed, locked doors just days after their Jesus was murdered. We imagine even in his tussle, the limping Jacob learned that the Holy One carried that news also. Fear not, peace be with you. And Saul, blinded by a light, came to understand the message and life he had in Jesus. He heard Jesus, peace be with you, and acted out of that. We too are blessed with that same message of peace, and yet, we fervently pray for peace. We yearn to be embraced in your safety net and held in your peace. And as we think and pray of that safety net and peace, we pray for Eddie and Bridget. Our very lives, the ones we see and live, so often drive us away from God's gift of peace that is there for the seeing, there for the hearing, there in our faith. Peace we ask for. In a world disrupted by the day's words and actions, peace from the threat of war and enemy making. Can we possibly start with ourselves? and make a difference in the world? Dare we see a greater reality than the one we so often fall into where we believe it's either this way or that? That it's black or white or gain or loss? Dare we see that it may not even be gray or midway between two points but rather it's perhaps something even greater than a compromise, something that you, O oh God, might desire. Dare we recognize the moment we begin to make our own arguments of defense or are beginning to dig in our heels. Free us, O oh God, to be your peace, which calls us to a greater good that can hear the other and begin to dream and work together for something neither would dream on one's own. We pray for peace in our near geography as well, for town and home. I think in particular, and I know you do too, of the deep grieving caused by the loss of two United Methodist Church buildings not far from us in Milton and Fonda, destroyed, destroyed by fires. The losses and grief are real. We pray that folks will be sustained by our prayers and eventually understand more fully that the church is the community of the faithful and not the building. We pray also for the church, the church. May those who are diminished in vision, mission, and in people be invigorated, challenged by your peace, your peace is not one of slumber producing solace, but rather instills within us a steady, sturdy backbone of openness, knowing, and hope. We do pray for peace, your unswerving presence, for we are pulled so easily from that by a whole variety of minor enticements. We each can make our own list. Often, however, we forget to name or list 
the deep-seated anger that sits within, eating away at us. May we dare to look squarely at it, ask honestly why it is, and sit with it, not so it festers, but so anger might be recognized and come to rest. Often, too, our unrest, our dis-ease, our unnamed distractor is rooted in the inability to forgive, to forgive ourselves. All those things we forgot, what we missed, what we couldn't get done, why weren't we better? Help us let go of our self-judgments so room is made for your love to be our lives, to be in our lives. We pray that as we learn to let go of our needless self-criticism, we might then be more forgiving of others. And finally, gracious one, where in our attempts we fail to find resolution with those around us, might we be as kind to ourselves as you are. Brother Jesus, we pray in your name and in your love. Amen. And the people said, Amen. And as our brother Jesus taught his friends and his followers, let us join together in prayer that those, in those familiar words, beginning with our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, dear friends, let us gather together in song as our gifts are brought forward. give thanks to the one who has gifted us. With these gifts, we make God's love live. And I add, even in this time of Lent, Alleluia. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And you know the tune to this last song, if you don't know the words, it's the tune is The Mighty Fortress is Our God. Uh, you may know that tune. Um, whether you do or not, it's our last hymn in unity. We lift our song. Please stand if you are able.
take in new members that day. So um, if you know anyone's interested or you are interested, even if today's your first day here, please speak to me or write your little name in the friendship pad and say it because I know there's some who want to do that and it'll be a great celebration of the resurrection. Go forth in peace, that peace which passes all understanding, that peace which the world cannot give knowing that you are forgiven, that you may forgive yourself, you're invited to, and that you can forgive others, and build that bridge of care. Go forth to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. And may God's blessing be with you, creating and redeeming and sustaining every day and every moment.